In 1850, a young African girl from the region around the southwest of Mondi, Nigeria, was introduced to Captain Frederick Edwin Forbes, the British commander of the HMS Bon Etta, and a representative of Queen Victoria in Africa, then taken back to England over the next three decades. This girl, who was given the name Sarah Forbes Bon Etta, developed a close relationship with Queen Victoria, being raised as a royal ward. But who was Sarah Forbes Bon Etta and how did she come to have such a close relationship with the Queen of England? In 1843, Bon Etta was born and named Omoba Aina in the Okoden district of what is now Nigeria. Aina was born into a prominent Yoruba tribe called the Egbedo, which made up a large portion of the population in the region of Nigeria, Benin, and Togo in the middle of the 19th century. In the Egbedo, Aina held a role akin to that of a princess. Her own country, however, has a long history of instability because it was a key source of slaves that were traded to European powers and then brought to the New World, mainly to the Caribbean sugar plantations and the former North American possessions of the British. This trade generally involved Africans selling other Africans, for instance, the powerful Songhai Empire ruled much of the interior of Western Africa around modern-day Mali during the centuries and would enslave their fellow Africans to sell them to British, French, Portuguese, and Dutch traders in the area around Senegal. Closer to the Nigeria region, the Kingdom of Dahomey had ruled what is now southern Benin since the early 17th century, the rulers of Dahomey had long acted as a go-between for British and French slave traders in Western Africa. The armies of the Kingdom of the Dahomey would invade neighboring regions, capture hundreds of slaves and sell them to the European powers in the ports of southern Benin, who in turn transported them across the Atlantic. Yet, this was all changing by the mid-19th century, as the Slavery Abolition Act had been passed for the British Parliament in 1833, effectively banning the slave trade throughout the British Empire but the response was slow in Western Africa, and such raids for slaves were still underway in the 1840s. In 1848, the Kingdom of Dahomey conducted a raid on Aina's village of Okoden. Tragically, her parents died in the attack, along with a large number of other elderly residents in the neighborhood. Aina, on the other hand, was protected, and as a result, at the age of just five, she found herself in the court of Dahomey's monarch Gizo. The circumstances by which Aina acquired her name and ended up in England were entirely tied to the mission of Captain Frederick Edwin Forbes to Western Africa in 1850. Forbes was dispatched to the region as captain of the British Royal Navy ship, the HMS Bonetta. His mission was to act as an agent of the British Crown and the representative of Queen Victoria in negotiating a new relationship between the British Empire and King Gizo de Homa, now that the slave trade had been prohibited. Yet Gizo seems to have either been unwilling to accept that slave traders have ended, or else found it difficult to understand exactly what it was Forbes outlines to him. Accordingly, Gizo followed a long-established practice when dealing with the European slave traders, of giving the ship's captain some free slaves as a gift. Aina was one of those whom Gizo gifted for Forbes in 1850. Although the slave trade was at an end, Forbes accepted the slaves in the name of Queen Victoria. Aina was promptly baptized and Forbes gave her a new European name. As a Christian name, he called her Sarah, but for her surname, he gave her both his own name and the name of the ship, thus, Omoba Aina became Sarah Forbes Bonetta and she was soon on her way to England. Captain Forbes' journal has one of the earliest entries on Sarah. She was introduced to Queen Victoria Windsor Castle after arriving in England, after which he remarked on her outstanding demeanor and intelligence as they were traveling back to England in 1850. The Queen was 31 years old at the time. The most remarkable thing about Bonetta's apparent advanced mastery of the English language precociousness that must have impressed the Queen is that she too wrote favorably about Sarah's intelligence in her diary. This first meeting with Victoria was a moment of some significance for Sarah's life. Impressed by her young African charge, the monarch agreed to pay for and support Sarah's education. Money was provided for this, and she was attached to the royal household. This is not to suggest Sarah was reared as a member of the royal family, rather, she was affiliated with it and was financially supported by the Queen. Her guardianship was held by someone else. Captain Forbes swiftly relinquished care for her, since his job required him to return to Western Africa a few months later, where he died in 1852. As a result, Sarah was sent to Gillingham, Kent, 
to be schooled at the home of Reverend James Schoen, a well-known missionary, and his wife Elizabeth. She did, however, continue to meet with the Queen on a regular basis. It was the fourth meeting between Queen Victoria and her young African protégé when she was brought to her in January 1851. Sarah's subsequent life in the 1850s must be understood in the context of the missionary work which was undertaken by the British during the 19th century. In the aftermath of the abolition of slavery, the view was increasingly gaining ground within reforming circles in England that rather than being bought and sold as slaves, the people of Africa should be civilized and taught the benefits of leading a civil Christian life like Europeans. Individuals like Reverend Schoen were at the vanguard of this Christianization and missionary effort. As an African girl who had taken to living in England so well, Sarah was considered as someone who could be educated and trained as a missionary before being sent back to Africa to work in schools and other institutions established by British missionaries in her homeland. She could be a valuable addition to the Christianizing missionary movement. Queen Victoria was certainly aware of this. She had extensive knowledge of the work of the African missionaries were doing. This desire to send Sarah back to the missionaries in Western Africa was compounded by concerns about the impact of the English climate on her. She got a terrible cough in 1851, when she was around eight years old, and it was decided to send her back to Africa. Sarah spent the next four years, until 1855, at the Annie Walsh Memorial School in Freetown, Sierra Leone, administered by Julia Emily Sass. Sarah returned to England from Sierra Leone in late 1855, when she was 12 years old. Another audience with the Queen was scheduled for this occasion. A sign of the affection the Queen held for her is to be found in her reference to her young charge affectionately as Sally. Indeed, some years later, Sarah would even attend Victoria's daughter Alice's wedding to Louisa IV, Grand Duke of Hesse. In the mid-1850s, a decision needed to be made concerning the future course of her life. It's been determined that her elementary education had been completed and she would not return to Sierra Leone. As a result, in the years that followed in the second half of the 1850s, Sarah was placed under the charge of Mrs. Sophia Welsh, with whom she lived in Brighton, East Sussex, on the south coast of England. She gained a minor celebrity status throughout England during these years, as the curious African princess would have been taken under the charge of Queen Victoria, and who was said to possess great intelligence. In the early 1860s, at a social event in England, Sarah met James Pinson Labulo Davies, an African-born merchant who had anglicized and amassed a considerable fortune trading between England and the Western Africa. He had in the course of his mercantile endeavors also become a prominent individual within British missionary circles there and in England. Davies now contacted the Queen Victoria to express his interest in Mary Sarah, an arrangement which the Queen was favorably disposed to, despite the age difference between the pair. At the time of Davies's request, Sarah was around 18 years old, while he himself was a 33-year-old widower. As a result, there are some indications that Sarah was not entirely happy with the match. Nevertheless, the pair was married on the 14th of August 1862 at St. Nicholas Church in Brighton. Fittingly, the wedding was officiated by the Bishop of Sierra Leone. Following their nuptials, the newlyweds moved to Africa. They settled at Freetown in Sierra Leone, where Sarah had spent four years between 1851 and 1855, and there were soon new parents. In 1863, a baby girl was born, which was named Victoria after the Queen. A further sign of the intimate connection between the monarch and Sarah is demonstrated by the fact that the Queen agreed to act as the child's godmother. Furthermore, on a visit back to England in 1867, Sarah presented the four years old to Queen Victoria. Two more children followed in the years ahead. 1871 Arthur was born, then two years later in 1873, another girl Stella was welcomed by the Davies's family. However, Sarah's health was deteriorating during this period. At some point, she had contracted tuberculosis, this infectious disease was particularly rampant globally during the 19th century, and there was no effective cure. The best treatment was to moderate one's lifestyle and attempt to live in a favorable climate, the disease primarily being one which affects the lungs. Accordingly, at some point in the 1870s, Sarah moved to Madeira, an island of the northwest coast of Africa under the control then as now of Portugal. 
Here, the climate was more hospitable than in Sierra Leone. She appeared to have only been joined sporadically by her husband, whose business interests were in trouble, while her eldest child Victoria was by this time living back in England, being educated at Cheltenham College in Gloucestershire. Unfortunately Sarah died from complications associated with tuberculosis in the city of Fuqal in Madeira on the 15th of August 1880 aged around 37. An indication of the enduring bond between Sarah and the Queen is shown by the fact that Sarah's daughter had been preparing to visit the Queen when news reached her in England late in August that her mother had died in Madeira. Thus 30 years after Queen Victoria had recorded her first impressions of Sarah in her diary. The ties between the monarch and the girl from Nigeria are still highly evident. In her honor, her husband had a near 3-meter high granite obelisk, or pillar erected as part of a monument to her, near her hometown in what is now Western Lagos. It reads, in memory of Princess Sarah Forbes Bon Etta, a testament to the remarkable story of the woman it commemorates. In conclusion, Sarah Forbes Bonetta's life is an inspiring story of a young girl's journey from captivity to becoming a cherished member of the British royal family. Her remarkable intelligence, charm, and charisma left a lasting impression on those who met her, including Queen Victoria, who became her benefactor and friend. Despite the challenges she faced, Sarah's story is a testament to the power of resilience and determination, and her legacy lives on as a symbol of hope and inspiration for generations to come. Thank you for joining me on this incredible journey through the life of Sarah Forbes Bonetta. Stay curious, stay inspired, and keep seeking the untold stories that shape our world. Until next time, do hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our next stories.